So with this side event, Belgium wishes to mark the importance of uh, taking steps to avoid that underlying, underlying vulnerabilities such as mental health problems escalate into complex mental health disorders and or addictive behaviors. Indeed, our Minister of Health, Minister Van den Broeke, has invested already a lot in our mental health care in Belgium and will continue to do this in the future. The importance of mental health from universal prevention, selected indicated prevention, over early intervention, over treatment, until aftercare in the general population, but even more specifically in vulnerable groups, has been supported by the recent policy that Minister Van den Broeke has implemented. Also in the, I hope, I hope to say past, past crisis, but I, I uh, unfortunately it's still the current crisis on COVID, um, I leave it in the middle. Mental health is and was on the political agenda next to the surveillance and restrictive measurements. Therefore, Belgium presides this side event. The risk on developing a substance use disorder is mostly linked, as you all know, to other mental health issues. Therefore, we invited uh, four experts who will enrich us with their view on why, how, and which early interventions can target underlying vulnerabilities, such as Early, early mental health comorbidity conditions and temperamental factors in order to reduce the risk on initiation and further escalation of addictive behaviors. Belgium itself still has a long way to go. We are working on it, but uh, important steps are being taken, but we still have a long way to go. So we have to ensure that our children and youth have timely access to mental health care they need. Low threshold and affordable initiatives at community level should improve the early detection and early interventions of mental health issues, substance use disorder included. This need became even more urgent during the COVID-19 pandemic, as you all know. So for the first speaker, I would like to give the floor to Professor Colin Drummond from for the European Federation of Addiction Societies for a short opening remark. Pro Professor Drummond, thank you for your support. Um, we just realized this morning that your name is not on our flyer and we really apologize for this. It has been a very busy, it has been very busy weeks and we made this error, so um, apologies. But now I give you the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Colin Drummond, I'm uh, president of the European Federation of Addiction Societies, which uh, represents 36 national societies uh, in addictions, both research and clinical across Europe and across 24 European countries. Uh, so on behalf of UFAS, I'm delighted to co-sponsor this important session. Uh, the issue of substance use disorder in adolescents and young adults is a very important but neglected topic. I hope that this event will draw attention to the need for greater international policy focus on young people's substance use and the need to invest in greater research and improved access to early interventions and treatment. So I look forward to hearing from our four world authorities this morning on this topic. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Drummond. So the first speaker on my list is Professor Dr. Hirtom. Professor Dom is a full professor of addiction psychiatry at the University of Antwerp in, in Belgium and president elect of the European Psychiatry Association. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Tom, Professor Dom, to take part in our preparation of this site event. He is also vice chair of the collaborative Antwerp Psychia Psychiatric Research Institute and medical director of the Psychiatric Center Multiversum in Buha, Belgium. Professor Dom, the floor is yours. Dear Tina, thank you very much for uh, these kind words and difficult words you have to pronounce in the introduction. I'll try to share my screen now, help me and say it's okay or not okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, full screen, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much, and thank uh, the Belgian government and administration for uh, for organizing this important event. I think it's so super important to highlight the importance of uh, prevention and early interventions in the field of substance abuse. So I applaud this initiative very much. Also, it links very, very good with the sustainable development goals eh? and goal number three, where you find indeed that strengthening the prevention and also treatment. So today we talk about prevention, early treatment. So the topic is well chosen in view of the uh, sustainable development goals that need or guide us towards 2030. So uh, well done. And I don't know if you see the, the pointer here, but we focus in this session on prevention and the different kinds with indicated selective and also case identification. Now the risk in having or developing substance use disorders, and this is a very short overview I will make with a, a slightly busy slide, is very variable. So we have a lot, a lot of factors that are uh, that concern the risk and, and mediate the risk to develop substance use disorders. And just go over some, it is the substances themselves and all the new developments around that and the risk that they carry that may mediate your risk of having an adolescence, et cetera, problems. And I'm very happy that uh, Professor Adam Winstock later in this presentation, in his presentation, will a little bit highlight on this and also give a little bit of tools, digital tools, how we can monitor our own use in using substances. But the substances themselves are so important. We know that the age of first use and specifically the age of first intoxications is so important as a risk factor for later problems. And this all relates, of course, to regulations, availability, again, uh, associated with regulations, but also important elements as parental control. So these are very important focuses of early interventions. Of course, we know the genetic loading of substance use disorder problems is very high, between 40 and 50 percent for a lot of substances. Difficult to treat, but always, and in addition with that, we all know that also individual characteristics, such as personality characteristics, and later on having a mental, uh, mental health issues or problems are all vulnerability uh, factors. And I'm very happy that in the next presentation, Professor Hendricks and Professor Conrad will focus and give some highlights on possible interventions to help young people mediate their risk on the level of individual uh, vulnerability and personality characteristics. I myself will focus on the importance of environmental uh, aspects and really with the horrible crisis and war in uh, Ukraine and all that this in, in this context, I cannot but not talk about this, this very topic and the importance of early childhood diversity as a major risk factor for developing later substance use problems for children. I'm very happy also to uh, mention that our uh, Minister of Health, uh, Minister Van der Broek, as Tina has indicated, we are in the middle of a large reform in Belgium, health reform, with the change and a very increasing focus on public mental health interventions. So also this fits very nicely in the idea of opening up early interventions brought in the public. So I think this is an important reform in Belgium where a lot of money is at this moment invested, for example, in developing the possibilities of first-line psychological interventions. So when I focus on early childhood adversity, it is really paramount to understand that early childhood adversity and trauma are of the most important risk factors in all age groups for developing substance use problems. It accounts for children, young adult adults. So it is really paramount to realize that this is a very, very important factor. Just to highlight some, uh, some data, uh, please realize that 
about one in four of all cases of people with substance use disorders can be attributed to early childhood adversity, which is massive. About one third of the children experienced uh, uh, early childhood uh, uh, adversities and about half of them uh, are exposed to multiple types. And for children exposed to more than four types or four or more of these adversities, and this is not rare, the odds ratio of developing alcohol problems or drug problems increased dramatically, about six times or ten times. And in a very recent uh, review in Yama Pediatrics, uh, this is just an estimation, but so many, about 21 million cases of uh, drug use can be related quite directly to childhood adversary. So the impact of childhood adversary on developing psychopathology is massive. And we can consider, and that is a broader field of psychiatry, that childhood adversity is one of the largest single drivers of psychopathology. Now, is the relation between adversity and the risk on substance use, is there a direct relation? Or are there other factors? Eh, because of course, when children have been exposed, there's nothing much to do about it anymore. So it is very important to see are there other factors that mediate that risk of developing substance use disorders. And happily, research has shown that there are indeed are factors that importantly mediate that risk. And of importance, these factors we might be able to target with interventions. And research has shown factors and mediators on different levels, on individual levels or intermediate and interpersonal uh, levels, even on community levels. And one of the, on the individual side, most important mediating factors is when children or young uh, adolescents are developing externalizing symptoms, problems, behavioral symptoms. This is a paramount factor that mediates the, and have a, an important impact, mediates the risk for later substance abuse between 15 and 80 percent. It's a broad variety, but still very important impact. And it is specifically that this gives you a target of organizing interventions and early interventions. So if you have children that have been exposed to early adversity and develop externalizing problems, symptoms, this subgroup of children really is in a super high risk of later developing substance use disorders. So if you want to do interventions, it is this subgroup you need to focus. And I'm very happy that in the next talks, uh, Professor Vincent Hendricks and Professor Patricia Conrad will focus on how to do this and even in school-based environments, how to provide some interventions that can mediate this externalizing behavior and as such also the risk on later substance use. Also internalizing uh, problems are an important mediator, a little bit less than the externalizing, but also there, I think Patricia Conrad and colleague uh, Vincent Hendricks will give you some clues. On the broader level, interpersonal family, we see that the parenting quality is an important mediator of this risk. So also interventions for this parental support and training are important. And finally, I point happily to the work of uh, De Waal in Amsterdam, a very nice research group that has developed a training model that is very effective for people who have already developed substance use problems and mental health problems because they are such a high risk to be re-victimized often by peer deviance, these associations, etc., to make them more strong and to develop techniques to avoid re-victimization, re, re So that's work to be checked out, also very interesting. So I really conclude, and I hope, Tina, within my precious 10 minutes, uh, I hope to conclude to say, if you want, if we want globally to avoid the development of substance use disorders in our children and young adults, it is paramount, one of the most important interventions is avoid, reduce violence, avoid, avoid uh, childhood adversity. It is very difficult, of course, but that is paramount. And if we do not succeed, 
we now have step-by-step -step possibilities to identify who of these children will be at extra high risk to develop substance use disorders and that we step-by-step -step can start to develop interventions. Thank you very much for your attention. Tina, the word is back to you. Thank you very much, Professor Dom. And uh, indeed, um, of course, the current evolutions and the refugees in our country, we will, we will have to address the mental health issues of the children and of the adults that are coming here with the big trauma. Um, I would like to pass the word to um, I'm sorry, to Vincent Hendricks. He's a research director of Parnassia Addiction Research Center and professor of addiction and psychiatric comorbidity in young people at the Department of Child and Adolescence Psychiatry of Leiden University Medical Centers in the Netherlands. You might know his name from several scientific articles. Professor Hendricks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chair, uh, Chairwoman. Um, I try to share the screen. Let me see if that works properly. Can you all see my uh, presentation? Not yet. Um, Oops. Okay. We, Let me see. we don't. Hmm. Okay, um, I will look if I can help you. Sure. Yeah, now you're starting to share. We see your uh, screen. So if you, yes. And now, yes, perfect. Thank you. Wow. That was uh, quite uh, exciting. <laughs> Okay, thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, for uh, for the introduction uh, that you uh, just gave um, in the in the in the in the shadow, so to speak, of that uh, of the relevant uh, meeting of the Commission on uh, Narcotic Drugs. The title of my presentation is "Towards the Normalization of Prevention," uh, and uh, in my uh, idea, it's not only about prevention of substance use, but a whole range of other mental disorders uh, and uh, bad things in life. So it's much broader. Uh, uh, prevention efforts, I think, or a target. Um, these are national data from the Netherlands, uh, uh, unlikely also uh, uh, in many other countries, so that show that by far most treatment demands in the I'm sorry. Oh. Um, that by far most treatment amount in youth addiction care concerns mid to late adolescence. Uh, and you can see on the right side. Uh, of the figure, uh, uh, these are nationwide data in, uh, in the Netherlands that nearly 90% of the treatment demands for substance use uh, treatment among adolescents uh, are 16 years older uh, or older. So we are not able, let me see, we do not reach our young people early enough and that's a big problem. Um, and when we reach them, uh, we see a pattern in which uh, the, uh, let's say, the substance use disorders uh, uh, are embedded in, uh, in a whole series of comorbid psychiatric disorders. And you can, these are nationwide data, data from a prospective cohort study that we're currently conducting, the Youth in Transition uh, cohort study. Uh, and we see uh, uh, overall that uh, the over 75% uh, of the young people that apply for help uh, at the youth addiction treatment in the Netherlands has one or more psychiatric uh, disorders next to addiction, uh, ranging from depression, attention deficit, uh, hyperactivity disorder, post-trauma, uh, stress disorder, conduct disorders, and also a range of anxiety disorders. So what we can conclude from these uh, nationwide data is that addiction rarely comes alone. It's always combined with a range of other disorders. And all, all, so there's quite a strong association with, uh, with poverty uh, uh, and, and a very bad prognosis already at a young age. And moreover, our data indicate that more than half of our youth that apply help at youth addiction treatments uh, already had received mental health treatment prior to their first uh, application 
uh, in, 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 the, in the addiction treatment uh, system. So taken together, we can reliably state that most of our youth already show early signs of well, what I should call a chronic intermittent course of both substance use and other mental health, uh, health disorders. And that should really concern us, uh, us very much and we should be worried about it. So what has become increasingly clear, I think, in the past decades is that we must reach our addicted young people, people at an earlier uh, stage when symptoms are still mild and transient, or perhaps even before that, when they only show precursors of possible, uh, excuse me, of possible dysfunction. Now, when we increasingly uh, know that one of the most prominent and central precursors of dysfunction is our ability, or perhaps I should say lack of, uh, thereof, to control or to self-regulate our behaviors and our cognitions and our emotions. And many scientists uh, from different disciplines argue that poor self-regulation is one of the core endophenotypes, a determinants of the development of many and perhaps all mental health disorders, including addiction. Uh, and at the bottom of this, uh, this uh, slide, you can see some of the terms that are often used to denote lack of self-regulation. So low frustration tolerance, lacking persistence, uh, no delay of gratification, poor impulse control. Uh, so it's all about uh, uh, poor well, self-control. Um, these are... Um, uh, uh, figures that stem from a very uh, uh, well-known study, and my colleagues will definitely know about the study, is one of the prospective cohort studies that quite convincingly shows uh, that poor self-control early in life is a, is a very strong predictor of many negative outcomes later in adulthood. It's the well-known Dunedin uh, study in New Zealand of uh, Terry Moffitt and colleagues, and among more than 1,000 children who were followed from birth to nearly 40 years later, they found that a composite measure of poor childhood self-control in the first 10 years of life, and you see those here at the, at the bottom, uh, so the level of childhood self-control is here depicted in five quintiles, so subgroups of 20%, ranging from the poorest uh, self-control uh, group, with, uh, denotes with one, to the group with the highest uh, self-control, denoted with five. Um, and that uh, uh, this, this level of childhood self-control was a strong predictor of negative outcomes 20 to 30 years later in adulthood. In, and it happened in all investigated life domains. So ranging from health to wealth to substance use problems, even to credit rating score, a uh, number of uh, criminal convictions in adulthood, and even to positive rating, excuse me, to positive parenting. Um, so... Um, uh, it might even affect the next generation. Although correlational in data, uh, in nature, these data or these findings uh, suggest that childhood interventions that are deliberately aimed at improving self-regulation may be effective in preventing these negative life outcomes and may result in accomplishing better lives. But is this truly the case? Is there any evidence for improving self-control by means of early interventions. Unfortunately, uh, the answer to this question is affirmative. Self-regulation skills are malleable and they can be learned through instruction and through practice. And, and this was clearly shown in one of the most comprehensive series of reviews that is uh, depicted on this slide um, that were conducted on this subject by Desiree Murray and her colleagues of the US Department of Health and Human Services. So it's a series of reports, uh, reports about self-regulation and changing self-regulation that quite convincingly shows uh, that learning to improve self-regulation is possible, particularly at an early age, roughly around three to five or six or seven years when there's a steep, a steep increase in learning curve, which parallels uh, quite rapid changes in the brain, which is still very much a high level of plasticity at that uh, age. And, um, and also that these self-regulation skills are set, still very much in development uh, at, uh, in, this, in this early period. In a recent meta-analysis uh, published in the YAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, a group of researchers, Pandy, 
uh, and his colleagues included 49 controlled uh, trials so of, 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 high, uh, uh, of high quality and high, high evidence level of universal self-control intervention in more than 20,000 children. Uh, these data are depicted uh, here, mostly under the age of 10 years. And what they found was a pooled, so a combined effect, uh, which was small to medium on both self-regulation and also on more distant outcomes, including substance abuse and other mental health disorders. It's quite rare that we find moderate size effects in the addiction fields. Uh, I can tell you uh, from uh, much experience. Uh, so this is quite promising uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the effects uh, are there uh, and, uh, and should be a reason to implement uh, these uh, interventions on a much uh, broader scale. Although the effects were small to moderate, uh, uh, I should say that given the high personal and social, uh, social and societal costs associated with addiction and mental health, it's important to emphasize that in broadly applied universal intervention, even small effects can result in significant public health gains at the population level because so many people and so many patients and young people can benefit from the uh, intervention. Um, so, I would like to conclude lastly, uh, lessons and exercises in essential life skills, we call it, such as regulation, uh, oneself, uh, self-regulation should be a routine part of the early school curriculum, very much similar to lessons in writing or in reading or in arithmetic or biology or history, etc. Second, these lessons should not have the character, in my opinion, of an intervention uh, primarily to avoid stigma and to pro promote that all children can benefit. Third, for some children, additional targeted inter interventions with prevention may be necessary and should be offered. And fourth, if we are able and willing to normalize these life skills lessons in the early years of school, this, uh, in my uh, conviction, may prevent a broad spectrum of both psychiatric and social problems, including addiction. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hendricks. Um, this was, uh, again, a very interesting uh, presentation on uh, the universal prevention, but also on selective and indicated prevention and making it part of our school curriculum. So the third speaker um, is Professor Patricia Konrad. She's a clinical psychologist by training and a full professor of psychiatry and addiction at the University de Montreal in Canada. She holds a research chair in preventative mental health and addiction and a research chair in soci social and community pediatrics. Her research, her research focuses on the cognitive personality and biological risk factors for the development and maintenance of drug abuse and the factors that mediate the co-occurrence of addictive behaviors with other mental disorders. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, she could not make it here, but we will now listen to the video message of Professor Conrad. Nela, if it works, you would be. Yes, we. Okay. As many of you know, North yes. America is in the midst of America. Hello, it's a pleasure to be part of this symposium today. I'll be speaking about targeted prevention programs. As many of you know, North America is in the midst of a mental health and addiction crisis. For example, in my country, Canada, one in five Canadians experiences a substance use disorder or mental disorder in a given year. One of, out of two of Canadians have or have had a mental illness by the time they reach 40 years of age. We have recognized that we need bold new approaches to address the widespread risk in our population. And more and more, we're starting to think about interventions that can be delivered upstream, such as preventative and early interventions that can be delivered to young people with risk factors prior to the onset of substance use or mental health symptoms. We need approaches that are more population-based, accessible to all Canadians, and able to address the level of risk in the population. Targeted interventions are also
Nela, it stopped. Based on current knowledge about risk, but also uh, based on, on the idea that with such high level of risk in the population, we need to dedicate our resources to those who are most in need. And finally, whatever solution we fall on, it has to be feasible. And so more and more we're thinking about programs and solutions that be, can be integrated with natural structures within our society. The school-based context um, presents a lot of um, interesting opportunities in this regard. Now, we have a long history of studying the developmental um, risk factors for mental health and substance use disorders. Um, there are a number of large European trial uh, cohort studies. Um, many of you are familiar with the Imogen study or the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development study. And there are also a number of interesting cohort studies that have been conducted here in Canada and elsewhere, for example, in, in New Zealand. And 30 years of this research has now revealed that there are a number of risk factors for early onset substance use um, and mental health conditions. Um, and But risk is multifaceted. It can be measured at multiple levels, such as um, within a, a really good clinical st or structured clinical interview. Um, family history also plays a role. Personality factors, and not just one particular personality factor, but many personality factors are implicated in risk for early onset substance use and misuse. Um, genetic factors, cognitive factors, as well as functional brain measures. Um, these studies have informed the development of a model of addiction vulnerability, focusing on personality risk factors and the underlying neurocognitive mediators of risk for substance use and concurrent mental health problems. The idea here is that if there's some if there's any validity to this idea that there are multiple pathways to substance use disorders and concurrent mental health problems, that we should be developing interventions that differentially target these, um, these distinct risk trajectories. And that's exactly what we're attempting to do in the personality targeted approach to early intervention and prevention. As a test of this model, I developed a set of brief preventative interventions that target these different personality um, risk trajectories and their specific neurocognitive correlates. Um, the intervention is, approach is designed to be brief and personally relevant for young people. It integrates many of the principles of effective brief interventions as well as um, cognitive behavioral intervention strategies as a way to help young people learn to manage their personality traits and to encourage coping strategies that are effective alternatives to substance use and misuse. A number of quite rigorous randomized trials have been published evaluating the impact of personality targeted interventions on alcohol um, outcomes. And across eight different trials targeting a variety of different types of young people and adults, what we find is that um, uh, personality targeted interventions produce a moderate effect um, on alcohol use, binge drinking and alcohol related problems, as well as illicit substance use outcomes. And across all studies, um, results were amazingly similar and converge around a Cohen's-D effect size uh, of, a, of somewhere between 0.36 and 0.46. So, so um, as a result of this extensive literature, the prevention program has been described in a number of authoritative reports on evidence-based solutions for drug and alcohol prevention. Um, the UNODC has published their international standards on drug use and prevention. The um, Surgeon General um, uh, published a report on um, addiction in America in which uh, Preventure is also recognized as an evidence-based program. And then um, the joint report by UNESCO, WHO and UNODC on education sector responses to the use of alcohol, tobacco and drugs also features a really 
lovely description of um, an implementation example of the prevention. Preventure has also been shown to be effective in delaying and preventing the onset of clinically significant mental health symptoms such as depression, suicidal ideation, um, anxiety symptoms, and conduct problems. And that's because Preventure targets personality factors that are implicated in not only substance misuse, but um, a variety of different mental health difficulties as well. So it has this dual effect that is often not observed in other types of drug and alcohol education programs. Neela, I think something went wrong. Oh, no. We're collaborating with a research team at the University of Sydney, Australia, um, led by Professor Nicola Newton, who had a drug and alcohol prevention program um, at the time that was showing some real promise with respect to um, being able to prevent early onset alcohol misuse. And we designed a study that would allow us to compare the impact of a universal alcohol and drug prevention program to that of um, a personality targeted selective program um, against a no intervention condition as well as a, a combined intervention condition where we would evaluate the benefits of delivering both universal and targeted interventions within a one set of schools. And this study was just remarkable in its ability to conduct a long-term follow-up of the students who were exposed to these various intervention conditions. And what was revealed in this study is that um, both types of drug and alcohol prevention were associated with um, long-term reductions in youth alcohol use and misuse, uh, measurable right up to uh, seven years post-intervention but only personality targeted interventions were shown to prevent and delay onset of alcohol related harms, tobacco use, as well as, really importantly, as well as mental health symptoms. So what was revealed in this study is despite the fact that both active interventions were effective in having a preventative effect on alcohol misuse, only the personality targeted interventions were shown to reduce um, mental health symptoms such as depression, anxiety, conduct problems, and hyperactivity. Our research has also focused on identifying proximal indicators of intervention outcomes. This study showed that um, youth feedback um, immediately following the group sessions was predictive of um, alcohol and mental health outcomes 12 months later. If a young person reported a positive ex group experience, having developed some self-awareness and having learned new skills, particularly cognitive behavioral skills, um, they were 25% less likely to report alcohol use 12 months later and 12% less likely to report mental health symptoms. In conclusion, underage substance use and misuse can be prevented, both through universal and selective school-based prevention programs. Skills building, correcting problematic social norms, promoting self-efficacy, personalized skills building for high-risk youth, peer interactions all appear to be important for preventing alcohol misuse in teens. However, selective personality targeted programs appear to be more effective in reducing higher risk behavior, such as early onset alcohol problems, cannabis misuse, illicit substance use, and tobacco use. Furthermore, the selective and personality targeted approach also has this added advantage of being able to concurrently reduce and prevent mental health problems. As we know, early onset substance use and mental health symptoms are robustly linked to brain and cognitive development. 
potentially causally, providing a very strong rationale for increasing our investment and focus on early intervention and prevention in schools. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Conrad. Uh, Conrad, she's. Uh, it was a video message, so we couldn't move her uh, image out of the of the presentation. Um, for the last speakers, but uh, not the least, uh, it's uh, Professor Adam Winstock. He's a consultant psychiatrist, addiction medicine psych psychologist, at honorary clinical professor at the Institute of all those difficult words, epidemiology and healthcare at University College London. He is an active clinician treating a wide range of substance related problems and common associated mental health diagnosis, including ADHD. He has developed a number of digital assessment and brief intervention tools and has published over 150 academic papers and book chapters. Chapters. He founded the Global Drug Sur Survey in 2011, which had had responses from over 950,000 people since it started. I worked already for a lot of years with Professor Adam Winstock. Winstock. He's a colleague, but also a friend of me. So, Professor Winstock, Winstock, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thanks so much, Tina. And can I thank all the other speakers for just an amazing set of and talks just compressing so much relevant information and um yeah i wish they all had, had an hour to talk so i'm going to kind of change i guess the kind of focus to how we engage and talk to young people who may already be using substances and focus on things that may be important to them and the reality is we have to change how we talk to young people about drugs because the world of drugs has changed forever from the growth of novel psychoactive substances to the appearance of the dark net, um, which increasingly is becoming a source of drugs for many people that kind of um, allow you to bypass traditional kind of like dealing networks and customs. This is the UN uh, World Drug Report that uses the Global Drug Survey data that basically shows that most countries year on year, there is an increase in the dark net. And that is a real challenge for law enforcement. But I think the other thing that has changed is that we're going to have to get rid of the moral lens, which so many people, particularly those people in government, view drugs. Because the reality is, actually, the difference, I think, for the most commonly used drugs around the world now, with the growth of um, regulation and medicalization of so many different substances, is basically where you get them from. So this is kind of um, data from the Global Drug Survey a few years ago, 110,000 people. And basically what you can basically see is that the vast majority of the most commonly used illegal drugs around the world are either currently already prescribed medications in some countries or soon will be. And so we have to accept that there is nothing inherently evil in a molecule. And actually our judgment very often is based on who does somebody get the drug from? Is it a doctor? Is it a dealer? And why are they using it? Are they using it to manage a diagnosed illness or are they using it for fun? And the reality is, of course, we have to focus on young people. So this is data from around 150,000 people. And we see that there is a huge decline in the use of most drugs as people get older. Interestingly, there are a lot of people in their 30s, 40s and 50s who continue to use drugs. And while many of these people may not develop problems, their continued use almost certainly will be linked to many of the issues that we've heard that have occurred earlier in life. And the reality is that most people who use drugs don't develop problems. The, the risks, that we've, as we've heard so eloquently, are embedded in your genetic risk and your early life experience. And some countries, particularly the Scandinavian countries, understand that and they invest hugely in the first years of life. You know the kids who are gonna develop problems in primary school, but unfortunately most countries only start investing once they've dropped out of school and committed crime. And your return on investment at that point is zero. And I think that's why this session has been so important. And so many of the sessions that we've heard have focused on identifying early risk building resilience to change these children's um, inevitable trajectory that often exists across generations. Um, I think it's true that most people who use drugs do so 
reasonably sensibly. Most people who use drugs are interested in their own health and well-being. I do a talk for school kids and it's basically called you don't want to grow up to be my patient. And what I've learned running the Global Drug Survey over the last 10 years is actually the most credible source of information for people who use drugs are not drug experts. They're actually other people who use drugs. And it's very difficult to convey risk information as being the dominant factor that is going to change behavior. We need to start thinking around using digital platforms and engaging young people around things that are important to them. And if you can do that well, you can start changing the conversation. And I think changing the conversation is a prerequisite to any regulatory change and other policy changes that may also assist in reducing drug use. And so I just want to run through a couple of tools we've developed, which we think allow people who drink and use other drugs to think around their use in a different context. So the first is um, something that we developed a few years ago, which was called the Safer Use Limits. And we asked 40,000 people who use cannabis to tell us what they thought the risk was associated with using cannabis at different levels, different frequencies and different amounts. And we asked them what they thought the risk was, risk of short-term harm, long-term harm. And we did that not because we're suggesting that there is a safe level of drug use. And there were lots of caveats here saying, you know, using drugs when you're young isn't good. You need to grow your brain before you expand it. And we're not suggesting these things make drug use safe, but they provide a very quick way of someone getting some feedback that is relevant. And so basically this takes two minutes. All you do is you open up the website that's safeuselimits.co and we say, how often do you use cannabis? And then we, there's a little note about what sort of cannabis you're using. And then um, we kind of really don't like tobacco use. I mean, that's the biggest public health focusing um, facing so many people who use cannabis, we have to get rid of tobacco. Um, and then we say, how much do you use on a day of use? These levels were based on the responses of 100,000 people who use cannabis, and we divided it into very low and low and high. And so you put that information in, and then it gives you a score. And that score is a risk level that talks about the risks, um, and it then talks to the sort of person that you might be and how cannabis fits into your life. And it then gives you advice around how to reduce your risk. And what's interesting is people like this because it's not drug experts telling them how harmful their risk is. It's actually 40,000 people who like getting stoned. And increasingly, we've done work looking at what are the most preferred sources of intervention. And for young people, it is apps. But if you're gonna develop apps, you have to think around, well, what are the motivations for people to reduce less and for young people it's not you know the risk of cancer or heart disease because young people are going to live forever and among young people one of the biggest motivators for changing particularly drinking is social humiliation people don't want to be frowned upon by their peers and so we developed a very very simple tool um, which has been used by hundreds of thousands of people now which was called One Too Many. And it was specifically targeted at young people around alcohol, but it didn't ask how much they drank at all. And we've done some work and it seems to be an acceptable way of getting people to think around their drinking. Um, and it takes a very different approach. It takes about three minutes to do, and it asks about the consequences of drinking. You know, when you've got drunk, have you, sent text messages or had Facebook pictures that you regretted. And we ask whether this is ever or in the last year. You know, have you got so drunk you can't remember what you did? Have you woken up next to someone who you can't remember because you were drunk? Have you fallen over, injured yourself? Um, we piloted this among um, a large group of students and one of the girls who provided feedback. This, we changed this question. And she changed her drinking because she realized her behavior when drunk was hurting other people when she was sober. And that peer consequence of intoxication is hugely powerful. So it takes three and a half minutes. You put those questions in and you get a score. And we thought we'd better give the score in Latin because that always makes it sound very grown up. And your score is an ask score. 
which stands for alcohol-related social embarrassment. And the highest score you can get is Cullis Ingentissimus, which is probably the only thing you will remember from this talk, because it means big asshole in Latin. And it is a motivator for people to drink less. Um, and this then links to another app we created called the Drinks Meter, which provides a, a more focused brief intervention. I guess the point of this is about understanding that we cannot pathologize all substance use by young people. We need to provide them a credible anonymous way of getting feedback that is meaningful and relevant to them. And we have to provide them with a culture and the tools to be able to talk about their use and what the function is. Because I agree with everything everyone else has said. If we can identify those risk factors, identify comorbidity, particularly I think you know, childhood ADHD seems to be so linked to issues of impulsivity and sensation seeking. If we can identify and address those things early, we are gonna let people grow up. And truthfully, that's the best thing we can do for young people. Keep them safe during the risk time of being a teenager and then their early twenties, and then let them get on with their life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Winstock, um, this will, thank you for your very creative and um, good practice you show us on, uh, based on uh, a lot of data of the Global Drug Survey. Um, your details were in the slides I, uh, from all speakers, so if anyone wants to contact the speakers, please do. Um, that's why we are here for.